Welcome to today's webinar, Dynamic Personalization in Healthcare Websites, How to Use Personalization to Enhance the Customer Journey While Ensuring HIPAA Compliance. I'm Jane Weber Brubig, Executive Editor of Plain English Healthcare. We are the publishers of eHealthcare Strategy and Trends and Strategic Healthcare Marketing, producers of the eHealthcare Leadership Awards. More than eight in 10 consumers are willing to share their data in exchange for personalized experiences. In today's webinar, you'll hear how to use personalization tools to customize healthcare experiences while staying on the right of HIPAA and your compliance department. Our panel of experts will share best practices to optimize your hospital website, leverage customer data safely, and deliver the more Amazon-like digital experience customers have come to expect. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. John Hours is, our, is CEO of Paragon. He has been designing enterprise class websites for over two decades and has lived through countless trends in web thinking. In his 20 plus years as a developer and architect with Paragon, he designed major web systems for organizations like University Hospitals, Franciscan Health, Cleveland Clinic, and many others. Matt Hummel is Chief Experience Officer at Paragon. Formerly, Matt was president of Red Privet, an experience strategy and design firm acquired by Paragon in 2019. Matt is an established leader and strategist in the healthcare marketing industry, having delivered meaningful business results for organizations including Duke Health, Highmark Blue Shield, and Geisinger during his 20 plus year career. Jeff Teal is the Senior Director of Customer Strategy for Epi Server's Personalization Suite. His background is in advertising sales, software, and marketing strategy. Jeff is based in New York and serves the North American market as an ambassador for the EpiServer product. EpiServer was designated this year as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for digital experience platforms. Today's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. To submit your questions, type them into the control panel and hit send. We'll hold your questions until the end, but feel free to submit them at any time. After the webinar, we'll send attendees an email with a link to the presentation slides and you'll receive a second email with a link to the to access the recording as soon as it's been processed and is available for viewing. And now I'll turn it over to our first presenter, John Hours from Paragon. John, please go ahead. Great, thanks Jane. All right, uh, according to Salesforce, 84% 80, of customers want to be treated like a person instead of like a number. And this is true in all businesses, but and nowhere is it more true lately than in healthcare. Many of the processes and procedures that we create in healthcare, uh, both on the clinical and administrative sides, are specifically designed to humanize the consumer's experience. From the forms we use, the scripts in our call centers, uh, even the decor in the waiting room, are increasingly focused on building and maintaining human relationships. And this is no different in digital. Uh, there was a survey in 2018 by NTT, and they found that nearly two thirds of consumers expect their digital healthcare experience to be similar to the retail experience uh, in that they expect context, conversation, relevance, the things they see on the sites that they frequent the most. And so and knowing that, it should not come as a surprise that Accenture found 83% of consumers willing to give up their data to get that personalized experience. That uh, was a statistic Jane used as we led in here. And we see these studies over and over that tell us the narrative of the online privacy advocates really isn't correct. That people don't mind giving up their personal data, uh, but when they do give it up, uh, more importantly, they expect you to use it to build that human connection. And the reason is because that's how we do it in real life. It's sort of like a digital version of a cocktail party. Uh, I say, well, nice to meet you, Bill. So what do you do for work? And then when Bill responds to me, I make a connection. I say, oh, my sister used to work there. Do you know Jill? Or I say, that's that big shop down on Superior, right? And what we're looking for is the digital version of that. Bill shares something and I make a connection and our relationship is better for it. So why don't we do this more in healthcare? Well, people care more about their health information than they do about other data. And you know, we don't talk about our health information at cocktail parties. There was another study earlier this year by Deloitte that found that over 70% of consumers are willing to share personal health information with their local hospital or with their insurance company. Um, but less than 20% would share that same data with a tech company or a retailer. And so why is that? 
Well, it's because they trust you more. They trust you more both legally and professionally to protect it. And so that leaves us walking a fine line. We have a consumer who is willing to share data with you because they trust you, but they also expect you to use it judiciously to personalize their experience. And that's a hard problem. Uh, and it's a hard problem, uh, which is why so many organizations are shying away from doing it still. And so the question we want to answer today is, is, is it worth it? Is getting the right healthcare message to the right person at the right time worth the risk? So I'm going to hand this conversation off to Matt Hummel to discuss what we can do with personalization when we get it right. And then I'll be back to talk about how to recognize what types of data we can use and how to minimize the risks of using it. So Matt? Thanks, John. So let's start by talking a little bit about what personalization is. Um, and personalization is really an evolution of what we've been trying to do in marketing for decades um, as we were trying to get the right message to the right audience or the right individual person. And now, um, maybe most importantly, at the right place and time on their journey. So as we start to decompose that and think about really what we're trying to do is we're trying to give someone a piece of information that's relevant to them in place and time and based on what they value in order to nurture them, um, encourage them along a path typically to a conversion. And when we think about how we go about doing that, uh, we're gonna talk today about really, we would wanna start with who's the right person. Uh, we need to understand our visitors, our, our audiences, and how to segment them into the differences of what who they are, what journey they're on, and what's relevant to their attitude or their value during that journey. And because that allows us to craft the right message to them. And then understanding that journey in a way that we know when to get that message to that right person along the journey. And that as they advance across their journey, we continue to provide relevant information for where they are, removing the friction points they have, answering the questions they have, and just giving them that confidence that they should continue to proceed. So we go to the next slide. We start to ask, well, why would I do this? And really at the end of the day, personalization is a technique to drive results for you and your organization, um, specifically by building better customer experiences that make people continue to engage with you to get those conversion events to happen and ultimately drive return on investment to your marketing efforts. And how do we do this? Uh, we do this by understanding what people have done in the past. Like, what John said is what someone would share with us. Um, and in the digital world, that really starts anonymously. We are seeing search terms they've done, ads they've clicked on, um, pages they've visited on your site, searches they've done on your site, uh, as well as when they've identified themselves to us and asked for a newsletter or downloaded a piece of information. And those, those interactions allow us to start to infer what that journey is that the visitor is on, um, and potentially what persona they really are, what segment they're in, that allows us to anticipate what messaging, what content, what functionality is really relevant to them right now, as well as what we anticipate will be relevant to them as they continue along that journey. So it, the, the idea here is to give people what they need when they need it to support them and make them feel confident that they're making the right decisions about their healthcare. So we get to the next slide, we're gonna to start to look at some examples of how we can add value um, through personalization. And uh, for our for examples today, we have a fictional national healthcare system um, the, to use to, to do this, but these are all examples that we've done in the past that are, are very achievable using some of the technologies like EpiServer to drive these uh, personalization tactics. And so in our first example, we have someone who is is searching uh, for knee pain, and the, our, our health system is running a campaign where there's display ads, and that display ad is shown, and our, our consumer clicks on it, and rather than going to just some generic landing page, we're actually geo-targeting them, and we're using that knowledge of them to give them something more familiar to them, which in this case is a location and a provider close to them, or a set of providers close to them. So immediately upon clicking through that ad and getting that landing page, we're giving them something that's one, more relevant to them than something generic, but two, we're advancing them through the funnel. So we're actually moving them many, several steps ahead in where they'd be versus a non-personalized experience. And in this example, 
once the person has gotten that landing page, they could actually convert with one click of schedule the appointment. So we really can use this to not only make the, them feel like we understand who they are and what they need, but also to, to drive that conversion event more quickly and more seamlessly. In our next example, we go a step further and think about a campaign. Uh, maybe in this case, you're running a, a campaign against orthopedics as a service line, and you're using SEM to purchase a number of different terms. Um, and in this case, the, our, our consumer is searching for a knee replacement. They're probably not searching for a joint replacement. They're looking for something more specific, more relevant, more familiar to what their actual condition is. And they're seeing our ad that is for knee replacement. And when they click through and they get to that orthopedic campaign landing page, we're again not showing them just generic content around the, the uh, orthopedic services we provide, but rather we're personalizing it with information specific to knee replacement. So the page can be a mashup of both general content about our orthopedic services and our capabilities, as well as information um, specific to our audience. Um, in this case, we have personalized a hero message, a patient story hero around someone who's doing a re knee replacement. We have a, a personalized call to action, and we have some personalized content about knee replacements they can download. So we're not only giving them a better customer experience by giving them more relevant and tailored information, but we're really avoiding what I would call design dissonance, where I would click through on a term like knee replacement, but then I get this generic orthopedic content and I'm somewhat lost for a second and have to reorient myself and find the next layer of content that's relevant to me. So we're really trying to make them seem like, though this is just exactly what I'm looking for. And we move even more into our next segment, uh, our next slide, we can start to use the power of the personalization platforms um, like Epi to take segmentation we've done through user research and start to um, use profiles and scoring to really infer which type of audience segment we believe is on our site. And what this is really doing is not only letting us show the kind of content they're looking for, but we're able to start to now message that content in the way that is tailored to what that specific segment values, what their concerns are. So moving forward in our examples from here, we're gonna focus on our persona of Joe, who's very pain focused. He's worried, he's frustrated with the pain he's experiencing. Um, he wants to be sure that if he does this, that pain will, will go away, that he'll have quick recovery and won't be in more pain post-surgery. Um, so we're really starting to move into a more advanced type of personalization where we're not just hit, we're not just customizing what they see, but we're we're customizing how we see it, how we share it with them. And so if we move into the next slide, we say Joe has come and he has decided to sign up for uh, an email around email newsletter around knee replacement, and instead of just giving him generic content around a knee replacement, you'll see we're starting to now change how we're messaging that content to him and we're messaging it around pain. Um, so this now is a one-for-one -one match for with what Joe is looking for. Joe is looking for relief from this pain and we are able to message him with something that's highly relevant. Um, and then as, as we continue to understand that and Joe starts to and we go to the next slide and Joe comes back say to our site, we're not only anticipating what he want, what he is looking for, how he, what he's interested in about that topic, but as he moves through his journey, how his needs change. So here we're starting to see that we're moving from talking generic about generically about knee replacement and talking about maybe the types of knee replacements that are available and starting to talk about recovery because we are we believe we're inferring that Joe is moving along in his journey and now he's looking for what's next. And so in doing this, we are really matching that right message to that right person, to that place where they are along that healthcare journey. In our next slide, we're gonna to start to talk about how do we do this. So we think these advanced capabilities of personalization just don't happen by accident. You need to have a framework and a strategy for getting there. 
And it starts with knowing who your audience is, who your audience is, and what are the differences in those audiences, and what do they value, and how do they go along that journey? And as they go along that journey, what where are they going to need your support? Where are they going to need relevancy from you? And then we need to build a strategy for how are we going to engage with you along that journey? How are we going to? What are we going to message to you? When are we going to do it? And finally, we have to execute. How are we going to, what data are we going to use to build that profile and score that in a way that we're going to be able to do that inference that I've been talking about to predict this is where you, who you are and where you are so we can customize um, the content we're, or the functionality we're giving you in real time and dynamically. So in the next slide, we start to look at what does that consumer insight work look like? And it really looks about like trying to understand these personas. So many of you have probably already done this. You're looking at what separates people based on their attitudes, on their behaviors, on their values. And we're looking at those journeys. We're looking at what are people doing? What are they thinking about? How are they feeling? Where are they feeling confident? Where are they feeling uncertain? Where are they feeling vulnerable? And what are the barriers they're running into? And it's through this that we can really start to uh, predict where we need to support them. So we understand where they're getting confused, where they're getting hesitant, where they have questions that we're not answering. And when we tie that back to that persona who has a specific interest in why they're going to look at this type of surgery, uh, we can start to really get, or whatever procedure it is, in this case, we've now moved on to talking about uh, labor and delivery, we can start to really address what that particular consumer needs. So in our example here, we have uh, Kelsey who's on her second pregnancy and it's high risk. And we know as a high risk mom, she has certain needs that need to be met. And so we really believe this type of technique works very well for all kinds of healthcare journeys, uh, certainly for discretionary or elective procedures, um, service lines like orthopedic or bariatric um, or cosmetic but also for complex care, such as cancer or cardiology. And it even works for uh, more routine care. Uh, in a project we did around primary, uh, finding a primary care physician, changing one message for that persona actually resulted in a 24% increase in booked appointments. So once we go to the next slide, once we understand what the journey is, we can start to match where are we going to engage with people along that journey. So where in each phase of their journey are they having questions that we want to answer? Are they feeling hesitant and we want to give them that little, that little bit of support to push them on to the next step? Um, what channel do we want to bring that through? What are our, our specific uh, marketing and communication intervention points? And then on our next slide, we see once we have that mapped out, we can actually look for where we can personalize. So where can we make this more relevant to the, the person who we are inferring is on this journey with our brand. And so we can really start to see where are there opportunities to use all these, these tactics I've been talking about to not only give people the right information at the right point, but giving it to them in the way that they want to hear it, in the way that's valuable to them, and the way that's most relevant to them. And so while this takes some thinking and some planning, the power of this is, 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 is hard to really measure because we are making people feel differently about the interactions they're having with your brand. We are making people feel like they are being listened to, like that this is relevant to them because it is. It's contextualized. And this is what will allow a customer to feel more confident about you, more confident about the decisions they're making. And once again, to make, make the choice to convert, to schedule that appointment or to schedule that consultation or whatever your conversion event is and achieve your marketing goal. At this point, I'm gonna turn things back to John, and he's gonna to talk to you about how you can do all the things I mentioned while staying compliant. All right, so if Matt convinced you that you, you want to do this, I guess it's my job now to convince you that you can achieve these goals. Um, but first, a spoiler, um, I don't have a silver bullet for you. Every organization is, has a different risk tolerance and their own interpretation of, of the law. What we do find is that organizations that are more confident in the value of personalization, as Matt presented it, uh, or the ones that have more ambitious personalization plans are generally willing to take on somewhat more risk to activate those plans. 
uh, but each of you is different. And so in general presentations like this, the best I can do for you is, you know, first to provide you some baseline understanding of what's commonly done, what we see in the market and in our customers. Second, to empower you to have this conversation with the stakeholders in your organization. And then third, to help you develop the questions that you need to ask to push that conversation forward. All right, so the HIPAA privacy rule specifically does address marketing. Um, it defines it and addresses it. And as a covered entity, as a covered entity, your organization can use PHI to market your own services under some circumstances. And you may do that already in parts of the organization. Uh, I am not aware of anyone, though, doing this on a public website. And why is that? The reason is there's actual risks to storing PHI in the web tier. Uh, it becomes very difficult to control that data. It's vulnerable when it's moving. It's vulnerable when it's being stored. And we're vulnerable to things like a break to the website, obviously a traditional hack, but also to errors that might be introduced into the website, software errors, server errors, software bugs. Um, moreover, as the data moves into another domain, we have issues with auditing and access control. Um, and we have usually many vendors with hands on a web server or web environment, lots of pieces of software, and they may or may not all have a business associates agreement. Um, we have the issue of potentially accidentally disclosing data if it's being accessed, let's say, from a shared uh, terminal in a school or a library, um, or if we accidentally expose it to an ad network or a remarketing channel. So lots of actual risks to having this PHI out there in an unauthenticated area. What we have to do as marketers is sort of drop our sights below this somewhat, uh, because as, as interesting as it sounds, you probably won't be doing service line personalization based on known diseases or conditions of the visitor. Uh, we're not going to be able to say, we know the person that's on our website is the one who just had knee replacement surgery, and therefore, let's talk to them, um, at least not outside of a fully authenticated experience like you might have inside of your, your health portal. That's not a realistic vision. It's not a realistic battle to fight. Um, so that leaves some categories of data completely out of bounds. And let's talk specifically about PHI. Uh, let's actually review the three, three basic measures of PHI. So PHI is health information that relates to, first, the individual's past, present, or future physical or mental condition. Second, the provision of health care to that individual. Or third, past, present, or future payment of that health care. Um, and that is when it's combined with information that identifies the individual. And that last part's going to be important in a minute. So when we look at the screen here, the slide that I put together, on the right-hand side, in the red box, we think, see things that are definitely PHI, really by any definition, by anybody's definition. And that includes all common identifiers. So social security numbers, phone numbers, their patient ID at your facility, <clears throat> all identifying information. And pretty much all your EMR data is going to be off limits as, PHR da as PHI data. So that's going to include treatments, conditions, uh, physician linkages, um, billing codes, so on and so forth. Any insurance billing data, uh, relationship with physicians, all is going, to be, is going to be out of bounds from a PHI standpoint for this type of exercise. There's also some things that are less intuitive that are going to fall into that bucket. For example, appointment conversions, and this one comes up all the time. When somebody does click through your website and decides to make an appointment with a physician, that is going to be PHI that links the patient and the provider. Um, also, things like patient photographs. If you're thinking about using patients in actual testimonials, we have to be aware that you know, a, a picture of a patient is, a, uh, is by itself a very identifying characteristic. Now, there's another piece to this slide that's not on here, which is things that are definitely safe. There's all sorts of things that aren't even plausibly PHI, and that's like, you know, what the consumer had for breakfast. We're not going to talk about those. Those are self-evident. The more interesting group is this group in the green box, which is sort of the gray area, the middle area. And I've, told, I've titled these things probably safe because we've seen over the last number of years, we've seen an increasing number of our customers using these. And in fact, maybe even most of our customers at this point now are using data like this. So probably safe, things like browsing and search behavior, on-site search, off-site search, what they click on, click stream type interactions, um, all generally not considered protected. Um, physician directory interactions, so how they search for physicians, even though they may be searching for a particular condition, generally not protected. Consumption of health, of health information. So even though we're looking at symptoms of a particular disease, or we're looking about self-treatment for a particular condition, generally not protected. Um, campaign inclusion and response. So if we include somebody in a campaign because we think they meet a profile and they happen to respond to that, confirming that they meet that profile, still not protected. Request for information, general information about 
uh, about treatment, about the facility, generally not protected. And then really the grayest of gray areas down here is things that are actual signups, uh, explicit conversions like wellness classes, support groups, uh, maternity classes, and so forth. Um, also, if we treat them right, generally not, uh, not protected. So most of these are probably safe if we treat them the right way. Now, it's critical to understand the difference between actual knowledge of, let's say, the, the knee condition that Matt described. We have actual knowledge in one part of the organization of a knee replacement a knee replacement event that's happened, and we know who that happened to, okay? That is definitely protected information, but that is very, very much different than an inferred interest we make uh, based on the visitor's interest in knee pain, based on their digital behavior, okay? At first, and Matt mentioned this, at first, it's very easy because the person we meet digitally is completely anonymous. They come to our site and they start to look at knee conditions, they start to look maybe at chronic pain conditions and so forth, and that person's anonymous. So there's no identification whatsoever. But eventually, hopefully, these people, these visitors will convert. And when they do, we'll be able to identify them at least by email address and maybe by more, depending on how they convert through the site. So we've got to understand that this linkage of data we collect in the marketing process and how they behave on our website is distinct from what we actually know about a patient's condition or their physician or their treatment, the things that we store in the EMR. And so on this slide, I've tried to put together a progression for you um, from left to right of kind of the least risky options to deal with this up to the most risky on the right-hand side. So on the left really is the least risky option. And in the, left, in the left case, we decide as an organization, our risk tolerance says we can only store behavioral data. No campaigns, no conversions, anything that somebody converts, we pass out of the web tier, we pass down to the internal systems. And this becomes basically de-identified data from a HIPAA standpoint. Um, except in the strict, strictest interpretations because we might have an IP address here. But this is generally de-identified data. Um, all we know is the behavior of an anonymous person on the internet. Um, and that works, and that's a very, a very risk-averse stance. The cons of this are several. Um, most importantly, our analytics suffer. We know what people are doing on the website. We just don't know who's doing it. We don't really know how to make a coherent story out of it um, as we decide how to evolve our properties and how to evolve our experience. So a lot of organizations move into the second column here, which is what we call segregated. And this is a hybrid. This is where we store identifiable information um, through a conversion um, in a separate repository from where we store behavioral data, um, possibly separate systems, sometimes separate responsibilities. Um, and what's neat about this is we keep the data separate. Um, so there is some linkage between it, but it's protected from being compromised all at once. And taking this sort of approach enables uh, analytics, it enables campaigns, it allows us to leverage the data in some ways organizationally. Um, and it's a good compromise, uh, but the con is it's complex, right? This involves having at least architecting two systems, possibly even procuring two systems to make sure we keep this data separate. So the third option that we see here, which we call combined, is maybe uh, is certainly increasingly prevalent, maybe becoming the most prevalent of the group, which is actually storing the behavioral data together with the individually identifiable data, okay? Um, this is still, we have to be careful, we're still not talking about PHI. We're not talking about anything we know from a treatment standpoint, anything we know from a condition standpoint. We're talking about somebody's email address, perhaps their conversion into a class or a request for information, along with behavioral data that suggests an interest, not an actual condition. Um, so the pros of this, uh, out of the box profile management of a lot of the DXP systems, including Epi Server, will support this. We can use them straight out of the box. Um, the con is that some compliance departments still don't agree that we haven't created a, an implied PHI situation. Um, but most sophisticated organizations that we work with are to this point. We store the behavioral data together with a limited amount of individually identifiable data. The fourth column here is in here for completeness and just to hammer home the point that we're not gonna put PHI out in the DMZ with a website and combine it with behavioral data. If we want to make that linkage, we're going to have to do it back inside the organization. We're going to have to pass that data out of the web tier and back in to join it up with our uh, customer relationship systems or our uh, EMR systems. Okay. So that brings us to a few key points that you need to know before deciding which of those approaches is right for you. Um, these will start the conversation, um, although there are additional questions, as I said before, each and every one of you is unique. So there will be some questions that are unique to your organization and your situation, and we can certainly help you think through those. But uh, as, a general, as a general recommendation, here are some questions you can use to start this conversation. Now, first of all, and most importantly, we can't move out of that first box, out of that first column, 
unless we determine whether we can store email address along with behavioral data. If we acquire the email address during marketing activity, so we're not asking to pull the email address out of the EMR, out of the internal CRM. If I acquire an email address from marketing conversion, may I store it with behavioral data? Okay, that's question number one. Question number two, what if I get other identifiable data? What if somebody signs up for a wellness class or a weight loss class or a maternity class? And in the, in, in the course of servicing that registration, I learn their name, I learn their phone number, perhaps I learn their address. Once again, separate from what I might know about them on the clinical side, you know, can I store this with their behavioral data? That's question number two. Question number three, which is a very important one, we're not gonna go deeply into this in this conversation, but the question here is, do we or will we share this marketing data with anybody else? Do we pass this out to partners, affiliates, subsidiaries, other organizations, and so forth? HIPAA treats those interactions separately, and so we have to be very well aware if we're gonna, whether we're gonna do this or not. Generally speaking, if we're doing personalization, the answer to this question is usually becomes a no. Okay, we're gonna gather other data and maybe use it in these ways, but probably not the behavioral data I'm using for personalization, but we need to have a concrete answer to that. And then fourth, um, is there an organizational interest in what I said earlier, in taking the data we're generating, the behavioral data we're generating at the web tier and passing it back into the organization? Because if there is, we have to use one of the more sophisticated data storage uh, mechanisms, one of the more, more advanced, more risky, but more advanced um, data storage mechanisms because I have to have a, a linkage then between the identifiable data and the actual behavioral data. So do we or will we um, personalize marketing emails? Do we or will we want to analyze this information later downstream? And those four questions will advance this conversation tr uh, tremendously in your organization. Now, before I leave this topic, there's one more thing that I think is really important to talk about here, which is the issue of perception versus reality. We've talked already about how we have data that we know about treatments and conditions stored on the clinical side of the business. Um, and on the marketing side of the business, when we use profiling and when we use it correctly, it can be a very powerful mechanism. We can infer very often from somebody's interactions exactly what their interest is in the health system and exactly what they are treated for and how they consume healthcare. Um, and so even if we're following everything to a T and we're keeping our clinical data and our EMR data separate, and we're generating this repository of marketing data, there's a pretty good chance we're gonna guess correctly. And we're gonna actually start showing them things about things they've actually been treated for, okay? Now, it's important to remember, this is not necessarily PHI that we've got in the web tier, but it's going to look like it. So we wanna be really careful as we use the data that we derive from these profiles. We wanna be really careful how we present it, how we use it. So it does not appear that we're leaking PHI when we're not doing so. And the example you see on the screen here is a, a slight modification from a very real customer example. Uh, in this particular case, we have determined based on behavior that the doctor, the physician on the left, is the actual physician for this, um, uh, for this visitor. That's the physician they interact with the most. It's a reasonable inference and it turns out to be true based on what we know on the clinical side. Likewise, we've determined through, not just through geolocation, but through interaction on the site, that this Philadelphia location is the location this patient's most likely to visit. We actually know that to be true on the clinical side as well. Um, and we know there's an interest in orthopedics here. We also happen to know on the clinical side that this person is a <clears throat> orthopedics patient, okay? If we put this up on the screen and say, your, your doctor, click below to schedule an appointment, your local facility, click here, you know, your treatment areas, your departments, something like that, click here, it is going to appear that we're leaking PHI because our guesses are correct. So we have to use a little bit more finesse. We have to take a little bit nuanced approach. And you can see for this customer, um, we've referred to the doctor that is most likely the one they're interacting with as a featured doctor. And we've referred to the location that they're most likely visiting as a featured location. And we've referred to the service line that they're most likely engaging with as the featured service. We still accomplish the goals Matt put out by driving that the visitor closer to conversion, by getting them there faster. Right? But we take a slight step back, and it's a very nuanced step back from looking like we're, we're leaking PHI. I'll caution you guys that there's risk of this on your own website. There's risk of this in remarketing channels. There's risk of this in shared data as well. So we want to be real careful. Um, but if we do it right, we can avoid actually using PHI. We can avoid the actual perception of using PHI as well. All right. So at this point, I want to turn this over to Jeff. Jeff's going to show us how we take Matt's vision we take John's recommendations and turn this into an actualized experience using a DXP platform. Yes? Thanks a lot, John. And, and I think we're gonna talk really the, the conversion between you know strategy and tactic, right? We've talked a lot about the tactics so far about some of the things that are out there and, and how we can do. 
Um, from a definition perspective, even though this is a little bit of a repeat of what we talked about so far, let's define the three types of personalization from coming from tactics. Uh, first one that we see across all web platforms is that static personalization, right? The name and address, and that's gonna be the PHI data in this case, not necessarily something we're gonna take advantage of in this case. What we're focused on is number two, which is going to be um, dynamic personalization, what we call visitor groups or rules-based personalization, basically something we infer based on the actions that they take and shown interest in and done on the site and then drive back with personalization. And then number three, which would be one step farther in taking advantage of that action, combining it together in utilizing AI or machine learning in order to infer certain types of uh, personalization and recommendations to users. Now on EpiServe as a DXP, we provide some pretty common tools to perform some of these actions. And if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna break out these kind of tools into different categories. The first one we'll dive deeper into is this idea of a visitor group or a, a rules-based personalization set. Now, just as a definition, uh, rules-based personalization are defined by criteria. So going back to the personas that we've defined, your personas should always wrap themselves around criteria to define them. Now, I will bring up a, a good point that we see all the time, which is that there might be a difference between the persona that you'd like to define and the criteria that you can actually capture, right? If your persona goes so nuanced as to talk, for example, about a high risk uh, patient, you have to be able to infer that they're high risk by the criteria that you can join. And if there's a big gap between the data that you're able to either capture, collect, or ask for, and then that criteria that you're trying to reach, then while it's a good persona, it doesn't become an effective criteria or persona for you to be able to act on. Now, criteria easy like IP address for geolocation or category viewed, those are pretty simple and to grab and, and take advantage of. And then once somebody's in a visitor group or a criteria-based grouping in this case, we personalize the content. So if I visit a certain section of the site and then I'm followed by a call to action as I go along, that inference is pretty clear. We know that they've done a thing and now we're showing them the thing based on what they've done. Now the value here is that you have specific content. You have a, an association between an action and the content you grab. As simple as I know they're in an IP location, so I should show them a, a hospital or a location near them. That, that seems to be pretty clear. And so that one-to-one -one relationship is gonna be where this tactic really takes advantage of. Now, if you look at the top right, I think we can break down the effort, right? Because that's all about what we're trying to go for today. Can I really utilize this? Well, um, visitor groups in general or criteria-based groups, they're very low effort technically in order to set up. Where that would go from low to medium or low to high is our ability to then connect that data in different ways. If we're passing in you know, external data like that you know, client relationship management data in order to create a better persona, then it gets more complex. From a technical standpoint, the more effort that we put into it, the more value it brings. If we're just talking about like site level criteria, the value of that is pretty low because we're only talking about a session in a moment. From a setup perspective on a marketer day to day, it's, it's medium effort. Um, it takes an understanding of my personas or the actual tactic in order to set it up. And then they're usually rules based uh, attributes. And then based on the effort that I put in a medium effort, the value in that case is pretty low because we still are beta, you know, and I think I put low here because based on rule based personalization, I am on the hook to create a persona and a rules based criteria for every single scenario that I create. And many people find criteria based personalization being overwhelming as you get more expansive, because the rules keep stacking on each other. And then finally, the maintenance and that goes back to it is becomes high because as I move along, you know, will there be a criteria for each type of person? As we really understand our users, it gets more and more diverse. So I think this is a, a great tactic for, again, these baseline table stakes type personalization methods. But, you know, there is a very clear glass ceiling where it becomes uh, a little high. Now, if we move to the next slide, I, I want to bring this home by talking a little bit about the difference between risks and extra considerations. Now, the risk is that you must be able to manage all your personas. That um, typically goes to not a small marketing team, but a marketing team big enough to be able to do so and to be able to keep uh, in mind all those groups together. You must have, again, access to data that creates that ideal persona. Is it enough to infer about a current user or what they're doing to really map against the personas that we're trying to build? And then you must have a clear idea, again, of what the persona should see. It's one thing to be able to define that persona, but is there different enough criteria in order to understand them as part of your user journey? Many times I get customers that very easily define their personas, but then don't have a tactic to push back. 
I was actually thinking about an extra risk that's not on this slide today, which is that you really need to think about time sensitivity when considering rules-based criteria. Just because I did something last week, especially even in healthcare, where my mindset can always change, is it enough to think that that experience that I did a week ago should echo into today? Or should we continue to visit or view everybody in the session? Um, we all make a joke about you know, the, the yoga pants corollary, where if I looked at yoga pants six months ago, does that mean I should continue to see them for the next two years of my life? Probably not. And in that case, you either have to give users the option to opt out or you have to opt out for them and think about them in the individual session. While that might change your criteria and change your effect slightly, it is an effective, more effective to be in the moment rather than trying to extend that long enough where maybe it's valuable to you to continue that experience. But me, I might think very differently this week than I did last. Now, um, extra criteria, extra considerations, your personas might be too broad based on the data you collect. So always think about how nuanced you can get. And then finally, uh, your persona should always line up with your acquisition and goals. If we're putting together a persona, think about what we want that person to do and how we want them to drive, because you can't measure the effectiveness of your persona unless you are driving towards a successful goal. So you know, it's pretty clear in this mind, whether it's a sign up or a booked appointment, but always keep that in mind. Now, the next tactic that we bring to the table, uh, going away from something that's criteria based would be content recommendations or machine driven recommendations in this case. Now, in that case, uh, anonymous browsing data is used and aggregated together to create some kind of inference about the user. Uh, within EpiServer, we use uh, natural language processing to attach the topics that people are looking at into a word cloud like you see here. That inference and that data analysis can create really good corollaries to populate like a block of content like you see in the bottom left here to give me suggestions about the next thing that I should see really going to Matt's right content at the right place at the right time. Now, the prime value here is that you want an evergreen experience that's always available, that's always suggesting and trying to get people to engage. It's never going to be that exact, this is my hospital, this is what I should do. But the value of an experience like this is continued engagement, right? We're always suggesting somebody, we're keeping them involved, we're keeping them in line, we're keeping them engaged. Now, I don't view this as either or. These tactics really go together, and there's always going to be wayfinders or points where we're trying to grab people and keep them along. You can always imagine a place on your site where your bounce rate is high or a dead end, where a tool like this can really keep them and grab them on. Now, from a technical perspective, even our tool, even though it seems complex, is low to medium from a technical effort. We drop tags. We utilize some of the same data that a Google Analytics is collecting, and the value is high. The setup in that case is then low too. We can pick these points. They're much like block elements that we build into the site. And thus we can continue to drive content because these are typically blocks you're already creating or elements you're already creating. We're just powering them utilizing machine learning rather than having to choose the content that goes there. And from a maintenance perspective, even though machine learning seems really hard to maintain, the machine is typically designed to have a set it and forget it type feel where we're monitoring performance over time and just adjusting rather than needing a whole team of data experts in order to manage. Now, if we go to the final slide, um, you know, again, let's talk about, um, you know, considerations, risk, and prime value. The risk here is that uh, we need to have good metadata on our content. And, of course, as we start to expand, we lean on our own data practices. And can't name the number of customers that say, I want to do this, but my data practice is non-ideal. Well, we can't do much unless the data has some kind of good baseline. And then you must do a good job describing yourself. If I'm utilizing natural language processing, I am keying on the fact that the words that you use on your page should infer the value of the piece of content. Otherwise, we're not going through and tagging our content with our intent of what it should say. We're letting the words speak for ourselves. So in many cases, your good SEO practice or good use of words on a page is going to infer good value here. Now, the prime value is we have to let the machine start doing the work for us, right? In many cases, even though we're thinking about these exact tactics, let's let the machine and technology out there really support us. And, you know, it's not an either or, again, it should be used in context and used in value. So, again, we're going to walk away from today with this, you know, great intent, wanting to do these things and create this great experience. We're going to think, where do I start? What tools do I use? And I think we pointed out two levels of tools that have kind of low to medium effort to get started that can start to bring medium to high value. And so get your toes wet. Um, we talk about all the time not boiling the ocean, you know, getting into this and being intimidated by the technology. Find some easy wins that will bring value to your organization. And as you show that trust to your customer, they will buy in more. Um, I give the 
kind of classic idea of GDPR, right? As GDPR was an opt-in situation where people started to infer and start to give data to people, that gave us the value and trust to have to start creating better experiences. What we found from GDPR is that it didn't create less people opting in, it created more trust. As we chose to opt in, we chose to get a better experience. And what that infers to me from anybody trying to be personalized is that if you show inherent value, if you show making somebody's user experience better, they will tend to give you more information. And with that, we can take advantage in these really great tactics to bring value. All right, with that, guys, um, I think that brings us to the end of our time. Um, I wanted to uh, thank me personally to the team for the invite for John and Matt. Um, I know to Jane, we have some time for some questions. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So um, let's take a look. Um, Matt, this one is directed to you. Do you have data on how many people choose to share a location in the browser? Also, how many choose a location further away than their localized location? I don't have the former um, off the top of my head. But in terms of the latter, um, certainly we would any design we would do where we would be doing geotagging and recommending or, or, or making something more prominent based on that geolocation, we would be sure from a design standpoint that we were being forgiven, forgiving um, and letting the person retarget based on a specific zip code. So for example, I might be at work, that could be an hour away from home and I'm doing that search over my lunch hour and so now I'm seeing locations that are, are close to work, but I'm actually really interested in a location that's close to home. So we'd want to be able to let that user recover and, and very easily customize that if, if our inference was wrong. Okay, sounds good. So the next question, um, and I know that you've covered this um, throughout the presentation. This question came up a little bit early. Why do you suggest segmentation versus N of one personalization? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Okay. Segmentation versus one-to-one -one is, is kind of the question. It Generally, like, uh, and, you know, ahead. again, it's all about maturity, you know, and where you are, and you can certainly start um, being much more basic and much more, more uh, focused. But when we look at segmentation, what we're trying to do is, is break down your audience based on what they value, um, how they behave, uh, what we believe their attitudes are, what we think will actually compel them, uh, what we think will actually motivate them uh, to take action. And that's particularly true when we get into um, you know, some of these elective or discretionary things, uh, services, um, where some people are going to be very much, we, we did a, a project with a, a physician-mediated weight loss center um, several years ago where you know, some people were motivated by health, some people were motivated by appearance, some people were motivated by being active with their grandchildren. And so understanding that segmentation is helpful to um, make sure that that message is crafted correctly. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, I'll just add, I think it's kind of an interesting question because in, in a sense, one-to-one -one is segmentation. It's just so many segments that you end up going one-to-one. -one. I, I don't actually think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think they can be used in different ways because a one-to-one -one type message takes in a lot of actions and noise about the session that I'm creating to try to create that level of personalization. That's good in context to a certain type of content that we're displaying, where personas allow us maybe to dictate the experience a little bit better as the marketer, where if I get a category or an opt-in, it should drive a certain type of experience that's more um, diverse and more driven. So um, just two tactics in the same bucket. Uh, in reality, I think persona-based driving allows us to then um, start the foundation like Matt is talking about in, in sophistication, but you're always going to be striving to one-to-one -one in some ways and then utilize tools like machine learning that can provide that one-to-one -one experience for a different type or a different part or different place of personalization on your site. Right. All, all within HIPAA compliance, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. What would you consider to be some of the quick wins and safest personalization tactics that systems can do if they're not already doing it. Who wants to start? I can start. Um, you know, I, I think it's um, easiest would be, um, you know, category based or like version based based on what I've seen. You know, if I've seen content on the site, continue to suggest. I think it's all about real estate, right? I think if you think about the real estate and the way that you present your data, 
you're always thinking about some kind of callback or call to action or place where somebody can refer back to based on what they've done on the site in order to return to it. So whether that's, you know, um, you know, stored places that I've seen or search results that dictate then a reminder about articles that I've seen, it should be the case. Um, the ones that aren't like the low hanging fruits are the ones that try to store information about me and base it over time because that requires like good data structure. So it has to be session based and even something like geolocation is an easy win for everybody. I think that's become pretty table stakes for even any personalization site out there. So try with that and, you know, mobile compared to desktop and, and some easy browser based or, um, you know, uh, situational based personalization tactics. Yeah, you I guys think Matt that? was, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think Matt was, I think Matt built it up well in his slides. You know, most customers do start somewhere around geolocation and do uh, take their next step into things like uh, responding to, to campaigns in a personalized way, responding to campaign conversion. Um, so I, it, it builds up from there. I think you've got to be careful as you go towards, as you work towards something that's more of a one-to-one -one conversion or more of a one-to-one -one personalization early on because you just can't augment the profiles the way we can in other industries. So we can't take other data and augment it and jump ahead of those steps. Um, and that, you know, there's a real risk of wanting to do that if you start to see some results from, from this type of behavior. You want to take that jump forward, you start to push data forward, and now you do end up in, in risky compliance waters. Um, but I think if you look through those slides Matt has, that's the, the progression we normally see from customers. Um, would you agree, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, John, even the example you showed with the, with the um, Featured provider is a way to help shortcut someone's help to flatten that IA, flatten that experience when someone comes back. You know, I was looking at providers. I spent some time looking uh, through Find a Doctor. I was viewing a profile, uh, and when I come back, I can help you shortcut your way back to that. So I think there's some areas where you can, in a, where it's easier to get started, but ultimately it comes down to what your goals are trying to achieve and are we using personalization to support achieving those goals? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have actually somebody um, tuning in from Australia. I don't know what time it is in Australia. <laughs> the question that they have is, have you found that much of this would differ on a global scale in terms of what users expect from their online experience? Obviously the legalities will change in different region, regions. I would say yes. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, other than the obvious, which is that the 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 laws fundamentally change from from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the I find that there is different sensitivity to data privacy in different areas, and you can see that a little bit, um, you know, where you know Europe and and you know U.S. differ somewhat tremendously, and you know, Asia Pac has different um, different takes on it entirely. So yes, I'd say that I'd say that you know you've got to look at at where you are doing doing business in particular, you know, where your patients are located, where your facilities are located, um, and not look not just at the laws there, but also look at the attitudes towards data privacy. Because I think some of what I presented early on where I said that people are willing to give this up probably doesn't hold true everywhere. Um, I, we work with, I'm going to not say the name, we work with One Health System that does have uh, some properties outside of the United States, and we definitely see that with them. I think the fundamental acquisition of healthcare definitely changes for region two in how and what information we're describing. So, you know, as we're getting to different regions, you know, the idea of acquisition kind of changes with what information we display. So I think that's going to affect a level of personalization based on just those stakes alone, what information we can acquire about them and what we can ask and so on. So I think as the region dictates like the healthcare process, if you will, that is going to spell out some different ways that personalization can be applied. Okay, next question is, um, when you're choosing a use case or a service line to get started with personalization, um, what's a good place to start? You want me to take that one, John? We get asked this question a lot, um, around whether we're talking about personalization or we're talking about optimizing the, the site content or we're talking about doing journey mapping or persona work. And, you know, I, I guess there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can look at it based on what are your organizational strategic priorities. Um, you can look on something that is complex and D is manageable um, to do as your starting point. But I, I think the best piece of advice I can always give on this one is working in an area where all the stakeholders are interested in doing this as well and want 
to participate in this and, and see the value in it and are going to be supportive of it. Um, because that's often, you know, the most, the most critical factor in whether or not we can be successful at doing this. It, this, you know, all this work could mean we have to do, um, develop more content around that service line. We have to be spending more dollars around that service line. And so having a partner, um, inside partner who is as equally motivated to do it, I think is one of the real critical success factors. Yeah, and I'll add to that, Matt. The other thing that's useful is uh, picking a service line where the outcomes are fairly linear and fairly predictable um, because it allows us to measure the success of what we're doing. If we can't measure the success and demonstrate it, you will definitely have have naysayers in the organization, definitely people we have to convince that we're doing good things. And if we don't have a very linear uh, path to an outcome and to a uh, you know an actual result, then we're going to have a difficult time saying, hey, what we're doing here is working. Yeah, we have certain personalization tactics that make the experience better, but they're not measurable, like you're saying, John, and, and maybe they're not so tied to goals. And if I put in the work and I do it, I can't look back at three to six months to see if it made a difference, then I just did work for work's sake. And what might like improve my overall like satisfaction score, that might not drive a metric that really makes sense to me. So always, in my mind, try to tie it as close to this conversion metric that we seem to be able to power and affect, because it could be possible that what we think is personalized and valuable not doesn't, doesn't end up being. And that means we have to pivot, try something else. And so you have to you have to try, experiment, you know, result and then and then adjust. So um, can you can you share some um, there's a question about sharing some anecdotal results, anything that you can sort of share about you know, how is this working once you go to this investment, spend the time to do this? Um, what kind of results are you seeing? I mean, what are what are some general generalized results? John, you want to start? I was going to let Matt I was just kind of say we love anecdotes. So I'll let Matt do it. I mean, I think it's hard to generalize, um, but I think that we've seen, and it also is to just point. What are the goals you're trying to really influence, and are they brand goals or are they you know, business metrics like conversions? Um, like I mentioned, we have seen some simple things do some double digit uh, changes in conversions. Um, so I think it is very contextual to what it is, um, how much we can generate demand or, you know, or, or, or influence interest in healthcare. That's you know, always a variable that, that is hard, but it also is um, how much traffic are you getting? You know, how, much, how much can we use this to actually, how much data are we getting to make these changes and how fast quickly can we see it? So I think that it is a start small, um, have uh, modest aspirations on what you're gonna do, and then experiment, as Jeff said, keep, keep iterating, and I think you can start to drive some double-digit improvements. I think, and what I will say, go ahead, John. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. What I will say is where we do tend to see some of the best performance, if it fits your organization, is in areas that are elective, um, because we find the customer's, customer or patient engagement looks very much like a customer engagement in, uh, uh, in retail or looks more like it, and the path to outcome is, is simpler. Um, and the value is uh, pretty obvious, uh, obviously quantifiable. So, you know, if we're looking for the areas where we see people maybe get the most, get the most performance, that ten, tends to be where we find it. I think finally, I think more brands are moving towards lifestyle content and owning the conversation rather than just being literal about their um, effects and capabilities. And so as more lifestyle or thought leadership content is promoting an easy win is relating lifestyle and thought leadership content to the services that I'm interested in. That isn't a direct tie. So I don't feel you know, um, exposed by having like my doctor show up, but I'm getting something related to my lifestyle and experience. And that level of trust easily correlates to more conversions because I've shown something that means something to me. And if somebody gives me a good anecdote or a good feeling about my life that I can relate to an article that I share something on social media, I'm more apt to then come back and trust that it, that service because of the, the feeling that they give me in that case. So, um, you know, content recommendations from a lifestyle perspective paired to offers and services. Excellent. I think we, we can um, maybe take one more question and um, then we'll wrap it up. Um, this question has to do with some of the optimization. So once you're doing this, are you, can you optimize it? Can you do AV testing, multivariate testing, those kinds of things? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you have to have a, a culture of experimentation. You have to know that when we try something, what a good experiment looks like, how much deviation, how much time, how much effort. So in fact, you know, typically you don't do something without thinking some level of AB and, and trying two things out to see what wins and what works. And so, you know, take an experience, try to find a way to cultivate an experiment around it, whether that's two different strategies and apply and Episerver, you know, acquired, uh, optimized it this year without sounding like a sales pitch. There's a value in understanding how that thought process goes and, and quantifying, you know, different decisions, whether that be multivariant or single variant and so on. So always consider that as part of your validation process in knowing that there will be um, something to validate, whether it's two different options. Anybody else? No way in on that one. Okay. So I think we're ready to wrap it up. So I'd like to thank our, our, partic our attendees for um, participating in the Q&A. And I'd like, also like to thank our presenters, John Hours, Hummel, and Jeff Cheel. And thank you to Paragon and EpiServer for, for sponsoring today's webinar. So one final reminder, keep an eye out for an email with a link to the presentation slides later today. And you'll receive a second email with a link to access the webinar recording as soon as it's been processed and is available for viewing. So on behalf of all of us at Plain English Healthcare, we'd like to wish you a happy and healthy holiday season. So thank you for attending, and I hope to see you at our next webinar in 2021.